On May 2, 2022, the Peekskill Cortland Amateur Radio Association discussed how errors in radio communications may have contributed to the sinking of the Titanic. JNE2Q led the discussion on the club's repeater, W2NYW. The repeater is located in the lower Hudson Valley and operates on 146.670 MHz with a PL tone of 156.7 Hz and a negative offset of 600 Hz. The following is a recording of that net. Do any of you have any information, uh, any uh, any interest uh, in the past about the radio operations of the Titanic and communications in general back then? Uh, anybody have any thoughts? Uh, any 2Q? Just throw out your call. 82 EVI. Yeah, go ahead, David. Okay, I did read, and since I'm sitting in front of me here, um, Titanic calling. It's a, uh, mostly it's a copy of the radio logs uh, that the messages were passed by the Titanic and the shore stations and other ships in the area. Um, so, um, and I read a book on Marconi. And I know the operators were employees in a Marconi company, you know, they, they did sign ship's articles that had come under the authority of the captain. Um, and generally, uh, messages pertaining to the ship's business were passed for free, and passenger messages, uh, where passengers were charged for their messages, and that's how the Marconi company made its money. So, thank to you. Okay, Eddie, uh, thank you. Very good. Uh, yeah, anybody else with any uh, past uh, knowledge uh, that uh, you found out about uh, over the years about the Titanic and its radio operations? Did not read uh, much about the Titanic, Jay. Okay. But I did read an excellent book called Thunderstruck, um, which weaves together two separate stories um, of a crime and a fugitive, and about Marconi himself and the, uh, the 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 dawn of radios on ships. So I recommend that book highly. I think uh, Jared may have read it as well. So uh, looking forward to hearing more about the Titanic. In fact, I haven't even seen the movie. Any two Q K D two I T Z. Okay. Thank you, Luigi. I doubled with you for about five seconds. Uh, yeah, the movie was I that uh, was terrific. I enjoyed it. I, uh, Ulla, my wife enjoyed it. It was very good. Uh, I can't remember something recently. Uh, I was thinking about antennas uh, on boats and uh, then I uh, thought about I can't remember what it was that piqued my interest about the antennas on the Titanic uh, back in those days uh, you know there was no uh, there was uh, very uh, little if any operations that were of HF it was all VLF very low frequency uh, the uh, Marconi company made equipment that worked on uh, 500 megahertz. I mean, 500 kilohertz. That's uh, below the AM band that we listen to. <laughs> I think our AM band ends at about 5:30. Uh, the entertainment, the uh, news, and stuff. So uh, they were operating on 500. And the equipment was also capable of uh, operating on uh, on one megahertz, one thousand kilohertz. Uh, so that was what they used. And as uh, Jared uh, mentioned, the uh, seems like the the main company that was providing equipment was Marconi. And they trained their operators, and they would hire them out to the various ships. And yeah, that's how they made their money, by sending radiograms that people had to pay for. Uh, I guess most...
most of their operators, their trained operators, were in their 20s. Uh, not too many seasoned uh, radio people. Uh, anyway, I was looking at the uh, these uh, the antennas, and uh, what they used was what is called a T antenna. Uh, you can imagine what a, a half wave dipole would be for half a megahertz. If you take the uh, formula 468 divided by 0.5, you'll see it's a very long antenna. Uh, and uh, I think a quarter wave, uh, I think calculated a quarter wave was about 468 feet. Now, they had two masts that held the antenna, and uh, those masts were higher than those four smokestacks. From everything I could find out, the masts were about 97 feet high above the deck. And uh, I can't. I couldn't find any about anything about the length. The ship was about 860 feet long. So just by uh, looking at photos, I would guess the antenna might have been about I don't know between 450 and 550 feet long, maybe maybe longer. The horizontal portion. So how do you get, how do you make an antenna that'll work on a so low a frequency? It's got to be big. So they wanted to have vertical polarization. So they had about five horizontal wires that were all interconnected in the middle. And then they had a wire, wires going straight down. And that went to the radio equipment. That was the radiator. The horizontal parts were considered a top hat to give capacity to the antenna, and then they had, uh, I probably used the ship, the body, uh, the shell of the ship as the ground, as also known as radials. Uh, that was the other part of the antenna. Uh, yeah, 500 kilohertz was, uh, had a range during the day, um, Maybe if you're lucky, uh, uh, maybe a hundred or so miles. And uh, at night, it, it maybe went out to three, four, five hundred, six hundred miles. Any two Q. So that's what they used a T antenna. And Marconi provided the equipment, and they all used Morse code, which is developed by Sam Morse from Poughkeepsie, New York. Where they recently had a little uh, a little radio event, uh, I think last weekend. Anyway, um, getting into the uh, communications, uh, it uh, seemed that uh, the operator on a Titanic there were two: the main operator and uh, his junior. I think the main operator was 25 years old and Junior was 22. The main operator was able to send and receive, uh, th a, 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 the claim was 39 words a minute. That's not too bad with a straight key. <laughs> 39 words a minute. Okay, so uh, the radios then use Spark, Spark Gap. And uh, when you transmit it on Spark Gap, uh, it was like lightning. No matter what frequency you were listening on, you could hear those signals. So uh, there were a lot of problems with QR, QRM. And uh, it was really rudimentary in those days. And believe it or not, there were radio hams also that used Spark app at the same time. The frequency they used was 500 megahertz, as I said. So all the ships that had radio equipment, they all used that frequency. So if ship A was transmitting and he wanted to send a, a, a message to ship B, and ship 
see someplace was transmitting, there would be interference. I guess they didn't uh, they didn't have too many channels in those days, uh, at least from what I have uh, read. And uh, the uh, I guess the English Maritime uh, and Marconi they developed a an emergency call of three letters. It was C Q D. Charlie Quebec Delta. And soon, uh, soon after that, uh, another uh, group came up with, I don't know if it was the Americans, I can't remember right now, came up with SOS. SOS did not mean save our ship. And uh, CQD did not mean uh, come, we have a disaster. It was just, just uh, letters that they felt would be easily understood. Well, evidently, the uh, if you look at the uh, a lot of the radio traffic, uh, and there's some of the some of the actual uh, communications are all listed. You can find them on the internet from the uh, that were received by uh, Cape Race. That was a commercial station uh, off of New, uh, uh, near Newfoundland where they would uh, be receiving and transmitting mainly telegrams uh, out to ships. And uh, those uh, telegrams, as Jared said, uh, people had to pay for if they were, you know, private messages. So yes, later on you can do a search for uh, actual messages received from the Titanic. It seems like there were quite a few uh, inter-ship uh, messages about sighting of uh, icebergs. And uh, most of those messages were not sent as messages to be sent to the captain of the ships. They had a, a method where you had to put on another three-letter code at the beginning of a message. I believe it was M G S or M M uh, M S G, uh, which did not mean monosodium blue to me. <laughs> anyway, if you wanted to make, if you wanted to sort of make it a priority that the captain of a ship should see it, you're supposed to put M S G on before you started the rest of the message. So moving along, it appears that most of the messages, uh, if not all, of the messages talking about icebergs were uh, never seen by the captain of the Titanic because he was involved with a lot of other things such as uh, going to, uh, uh, I guess, uh, entertainment with passengers on the ships, uh, on the ship, and uh, it, it appears he did not see them. If he did, he uh, if he did, he didn't pay attention to them. He did not survive. He went down with the ship, and uh, there's uh, there was really no reports to say whether he got them and he didn't pay attention. There were also reports that the uh, one of the executives of White Star Line was on a ship, and uh, he possibly encouraged the captain to not slow down. In the light of the fact that there were there were in an area where there was many icebergs, so this is any two Q. The uh, The, there was a ship that was very nearby to the, uh, I think it was called, the, it was the Californian. I think it was 19 miles away. Uh, and uh, they were they were sailing out in that area and uh, they saw a lot of icebergs right around their area. So the captain, uh, they were losing light and he decided to stop. 
uh, not even move at any at any speed, just stop. Uh, and uh, the, the idea was they would resume their their journey in, as soon as first light appeared, because the captain wisely said, "Hey, there's too many icebergs around. I don't want to hit one." But he did tell his radio officer to send out messages alerting all the ships that could in the area that could or in the range of their radio signals that icebergs were prevalent and they were sighting them and they were stopping so this gets uh, quite interesting when uh, the, the Californian radio operator sent out a message he was sending it out to uh, I guess the Titanic and some other ships whoever could hear in the area and when he was sending, he was interrupted by the operator of the Titanic, who said, Shut up, shut up. I'm busy. I'm working Cape Race. So he was getting, he was listening and copying telegrams being sent by Cape Race, the uh, land station up New, near Newfoundland that I mentioned and uh, he didn't he, he felt it was an interruption to him you know QR, QR Mexico <laughs> and uh, he, he told the uh, operator of the California to shut up so the, Cal the operator thought that was pretty rude and uh, he shut off his radio and went to sleep In those days, there was no requirement that you had to, you had to have a, a monitoring of, uh, of shipboard traffic 24 hours a day. So, uh, yeah, that soon changed after this uh, tragic event. Anyway, the Californian radio operator, who was also a Marconi operator, he went to sleep. Uh, an hour and 40 minutes later, the Titanic hit and I hit the iceberg. It did come out uh, later on. They interviewed the uh, operator of the Titanic radio station, and uh, he he did admit that he did not send the letters M S G or M G S, whatever those three letters were. Uh, he didn't preface his message about the icebergs. Uh, so nobody knows whether if he would, did that, if the captain of the Titanic would have uh, been handed that message or not. Anyway, it was a, uh, a, a, a some some bad errors there. QR Mexico and uh, and the operator of the Titanic uh, telling this fellow to shut up, and he said, "Heck with him. <laughs> I guess I'll shut up." Anyway, it appears that after they hit the iceberg, uh, they, I think, I'm just looking here, uh, it says here, Cape Race had a message at uh, 10.25 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from the Titanic that they said uh, they're calling CQD gave their position 380 miles south southeast of Cape Race and uh, they said uh, and then at 1035 they gave another corrected position which was uh, the original position was six miles off and he says and they said I've struck iceberg anyway uh, the nearest ship 19 miles away they probably could have been in, been there in uh, uh, probably an hour but they didn't get any message because their radio operator was sleeping sounds hard to believe and uh, they, uh, there were other ships getting the messages from the Titanic uh, there was a ship called the Virginian and they said they're going to start heading there and uh, some were a little slow to react, 
the Carpathia, I'm sure you've heard, that was the ship that did respond. Uh, but they were about uh, 60 miles away. And uh, it took them about four hours to uh, get there. They did send messages, we're on the way. Unfortunately, the ship went down two hours before they arrived. From the time the, uh, the first message was sent out, at 10.25 p.m. Uh, it looks like the, uh, I think it was 2.05, uh, 2.12.50, uh, the Virginian ship said uh, they heard the last Titanic message at 12.27. So you're talking about 10.25 to 12.27, that's about two hours. Uh, unless I'm confused, yeah, t the two hours uh, when the signals ended abruptly and uh, all the ships were talking to each other and they were all trying to help but uh, the Carpathia did get there uh, late and uh, uh, Luigi, did I time out the repeater? Um, you finished off at saying that Car Carpathia did get there. Go ahead, KD2ITZ. Sorry about that, gentlemen. Yeah, they got there uh, late. Uh, uh, approximately 720 passes did pick up all the boxes. About 300. And... Uh, you know, you go in the water and those cold temperatures, I think they said the temperature was centigrade. And uh, you go in as those in the water, you can't last for more than a few minutes, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, I picked uh, those people up, and other ships did get there, and uh, they didn't find much. They found floating debris, and they didn't find uh, many uh, many bodies. So, uh, talking about uh, QRM and uh, poor etiquette and no control. Uh, after the hearings, there was hearings in the in the England, in the in the U.S. in the U.S. Senate, they questioned all the people that were involved. Uh, the major people and uh, one of the things that came out in hearing was that hams were interfering uh, probably inadvertently trying to talk uh, probably everybody's on the same frequency and uh, some of the ships that were out there said they were ham radio operators they were hearing their signals and they were having trouble communicating because of the hams Probably the hands are trying to uh, <laughs> do some good things there, but uh, uh, there was some uh, uh, complaints about that. And uh, four months after the Titanic was lost, the U.S. government passed the Radio Act of 1912. Uh, it was the first action taken by the government to gain control of the airwaves and required all operators to hold a valid federal license to use radio transmitters. In addition, it restricted the uses, uses to bands, uh, amateur uses to bands less than 200 meters. So they didn't want them to uh, go down uh, where the maritime communications were being conducted. So they could, they had to go uh, 200 meters and up. Uh, anyway, uh, so they figured, that, and that was probably a, a good thing for hams because uh, a lot of people thought that anything above 200 meters it was totally unusable. In those days, everybody thought that you could not communicate anything above 200 meters. So the, I guess the government, uh, the U.S. government felt uh, they're not giving away anything by telling the radio here that they have to go above 200. He also said if you 
operated as an amateur, or license or no license, if you were, if you were, if you were, uh, violated these regulations, you could receive a twenty-five hundred dollar fine, which today is equal to about sixty-three thousand dollars. That's up to five years in prison. Uh, so, yeah, it was impossible to blame only the hams. Uh, it was basically a combination of poor leadership, uh, a lack of real good emergency preparation, both by professionals and novice uh, radio errors, uh, and that was just too much, too many things went wrong. And unfortunately, at that time, it was the greatest marine disaster in the history. So, anybody have any comments or thoughts? Hope I didn't put all you guys to sleep. KD2CT, Rob, go ahead. AD2CT to NE2Q. Uh, I didn't know anything about... Uh the radio operators on the Titanic or in the uh, nearby ships, so I thought this was uh, really interesting. So thanks very much for uh, preparing this. Uh, NE2Q from AD2CT. Okay, thank you. Uh, David, uh, go ahead, KD2EVI. Q in a group from KD2 of Yai. Well, thank you, Jay. It's, uh, that's very interesting. And speaking of uh, QRM, in a book I mentioned, uh, the when the Carpathia was coming back and was bombard, obviously bombarded with messages, as uh, you know, want to know who the survivors were, and they were putting the list together. Um, Carpathia only had one operator, and the surviving uh, operator from Titanic had to uh, pitch in and help send messages. But the Carpathia was jammed by the U.S. Navy stations. Uh, Navy shore stations in Boston and some ships. We were accustomed to closing stations at a particular time in the evening. And uh, they were very upset that the Carpathia was uh, on their airwaves. And they actually jammed the messages. So it wasn't just the amateurs causing problems in that. But uh, back to you, Jay, from KD2 EVI. Yeah, well, I guess in those days uh, there was uh, uh, no control of radio and uh, probably very little thought went into preparation in times of emergencies and who should do what, who should talk and who should listen and, and uh, that quickly changed. Uh, and <laughs> A good old uh, the precursor to the FCC was born. born. <laughs> I guess in those days, when you transmitted, you know, with Spark App, uh, if, if, if you were on 500 megahertz or 495 megahertz, it wouldn't make any difference. You, you would be still be heard, no matter what frequency you were listening on, if you were anywhere within probably five or uh, you know, ten kil uh, megahertz. So that's probably why another reason there was so much interference. There was like no channelization. Uh, you couldn't do that with Spark. When you hear a lightning crash, you'll hear it uh, on uh, long, low frequency, you'll hear it on a high frequency, sometimes you'll even hear it on VHF. So that, those type of uh, you know, spark transmitters, all they are were, were little producers of lightning. KB2HXZ, what do you say, Jared? Any 2 q this is KD2HXZ. Uh, Jay, I really enjoyed uh, all the information you gave out. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I've seen the movie. Um, you know, I, re I read Thunderstruck. And I'm very, very fascinated with the way things were back in those days, and I always ask myself, and maybe one has to ask himself, gee, imagine if they had this type of technology back then, and, uh, I mean, you know, heck, I mean, if that, God forbid, happened today, how would our technology come into play and save those people? 
Would we send in helicopters? Would we sell, uh, send in uh, fast boats? I mean, you know, how would we do it? Would, would a submarine uh, locally positioned? I mean, what would happen today if it happened? And uh, I, I think about that. And when I take out my canoe, I, uh, I'm in the water and I'm thinking, boy, how much would this canoe would have been worth when the Titanic sank? And if you were confronted with those seas and you had my canoe there, you'd take my canoe in a heartbeat. But, uh, you know, very, very interesting learning about the, the, the jamming history and uh, David's point that uh, it was the Navy uh, involved with that as well. And, and, of course, the whole theme of this is proper etiquette uh, on the waves, you know, uh, saying the right things at the right time. And, uh, you know, still just a terrible tragedy in the, in the history of, uh, of uh, naval uh, navigation. Very good, Jay. I really enjoyed it. Uh, KD2HXZ, back to NE2Q. Okay, after uh, we hear from uh, Mike and Luigi, I'm going to give you some uh, further information about search and rescue. Uh, years ago, I was in the U.S. Coast Guard, and I was in the search and rescue uh, division. And I'll tell you what, uh, what was going on back then, which, of course, is obsolete now. Uh, go ahead there, Mike, N2EAB, Eddie2Q. Uh, very good, Jay. Yeah, I'm very uh, pleased that uh, you presented this uh, this evening because uh, I, it's, it's sort of like the backstory of, uh, of uh, two-way communications at that time. It's, it seems like uh, radio operations then was, was like the wild, wild west. <laughs> With uh, very few rules and, uh, and like you said, uh, improper etiquette. So uh, again, I appreciate the uh, the information, and so I'm looking forward to hearing more from you. And uh, this is N2 EAV back to uh, NE2Q. Okay, Mike. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I'll comment about. Uh, what you said, Jared, what would happen today in a, in a, in a, as part of this tonight. Uh, Lou, go ahead. Thank you, Jay. NE2Q and the group from KD2ITZ. Well, um, if there is anything that sounds like a foghorn on this transmission, it may or may not be uh, a trombone emission from uh, a certain uh, licensed amateur who is not intentionally causing interference but um, I, I, I will say I'm always trying to think of the lessons uh, that we could um, learn from the past as we apply it to the future uh, of course um, many of us cause uh, unintentional interference all the time we, uh, we have devices in our homes that um, cause emit RF emissions and uh, it just pollutes the spectrum, and um, I, I was just listening to an interview with a ham uh, who was very focused on diversity reception to try to null out a lot of the noise in his urban environment uh, because uh, it, it can be um, quite a burden. So um, we should all be mindful of that. Uh, I think hams are more mindful than others in this regard, but... You know, with uh, thousands and thousands of unregulated transmitters, there's a lot of noise on the bands. So very interesting, Jay. Uh, thank you very much. NE2Q in the group, KB2ITZ. Yeah, can you all imagine if we were still using spark gap transmitters? <laughs> it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be too much fun as compared to what we used to. Uh, a little uh, additional note, um, one of the claims of, uh, of Robert Sardoff, who was a young boy who worked in, in Manhattan, uh, he, I can't remember, he was working for some wireless company, he, he, he picked up uh, communications from the Titanic. He was hearing, uh, and he reported to, I guess, the local newspapers. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Robert Sarnoff was, he became, he uh, 
went from be, being a radio wireless operator to the founder of Radio Corporation of America. Uh, that's a little aside there, note. I was in the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, I joined it uh, about 1963, and I was uh, in communications as a part of search and rescue. And uh, I was already a ham, so it was. <laughs> they figured it would be put, smart to put me into communications not, instead of, uh, you know, uh, being a deckhand. Anyway, at that time they were just starting something called AMVER, A M V E R. And uh, I used to go to uh, meetings down in the U.S. Customs House, down in the bottom of Manhattan southern end of the tip there in the U.S. Customs House. The Coast Guard had a big computer in there. And in those days when they had the punch cards on the computers, the computers took up, uh, you, know, they were, you know, 15, 20 feet long. And they were pretty big. And they needed a lot of people to work on it. Amver. It was called Automated Merchant Vessel Emergency Reporting. And the Coast Guard uh, the, was, uh, was getting this going, and the idea was that ships would, uh, or, or any, any place in the world, would call in uh, by radio, uh, either relay their messages if they couldn't reach uh, the USA or, uh, or send directly if they were close enough, give their positions. And this would all be tracked on this computer. So if there was a, 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 a disaster at sea, the Coast Guard would know which ships were closest to the ship that was uh, having uh, trouble. It was called the yeah, Amber, and of course that is pretty much obsolete. Uh, moving fast forward, um, uh, the uh, the use of the emergency locator transmitter came about, I would say, in the uh, maybe the early seventies. There was a ham that I used to speak to in uh, New Rochelle. I can't remember his call. His name was Steve Galatzer. And uh, Steve, I talked to him on two meters. When I would go out to lunch from my office, and sometimes he went out to lunch and we'd talk on the radio while we were driving our cars. He told me, I'm working on something that uh, if, if a plane went down, uh, a, a transmitter would automatically transmit and uh, it, and we would be able to locate the aircraft. He was working out on that for a couple of years. He was a pilot. He had his own twin-engine aircraft at Westchester Airport, so he loved flying. And uh, w after a number of years, one day he said, I'm going to Washington. I'm giving them a demonstration. I'm flying down there. So he gave them a demonstration and... Uh, they hid one of these little uh, transmitters someplace, I don't know where, within a uh, hundred miles of the airport where his plane was. He took, and they turned it on, and he, he found it. He went up in the air and he found it. Well, soon after that, the uh, FAA made uh, the use of an emergency locator transmitter uh, mandatory. All commercial aircraft, and then I think eventually maybe private aircraft. So uh, his company uh, was the only company in the world making them. He was making one at a time. Well, he had to ramp up pretty quick, and he called his company Emergency Beacon Corporation, right out of New Rochelle, New York. And he, he, even, he even at one time was making a two-meter synthesized transceiver. It was the first synthesized transceiver on the market for ham use for the two-meter band. Up until that time, 
all the uh, radios were con uh, frequencies were controlled by crystals. And, uh, you could put in maybe five crystals or ten crystals in the little sockets, and you would just have a little switch to switch frequencies. But the first person that made a synthesized transceiver for two was Steve. And uh, I think Tom, K2UT, has one of those radios. Jump forward again. Uh, Jared, if something like that happens today, just think of all the equipment that they have uh, on these uh, ships. They have satellite radios powered with a little uh, handheld uh, satellite radio. They can call and say, hey, we're, uh, we're sinking. This is the Titanic. We got hit, just hit an iceberg, and uh, I'm sure they can get help pretty quick. Uh, now, since satellite radios came out, something even newer called a spark, tr a spark transmitter. Has anybody heard uh, 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 what a spark transmitter is? This has nothing to do with a uh, spark gap. Uh, any, uh, anybody ha heard of that? Well, you're about to about spark transmitters. There are companies now making transmitters that are about three inches high by maybe two inches wide and maybe uh, an inch thick. Two inches by three inches by an inch. Picture how small that is. It's called a spark transmitter. You buy it, two or three hundred dollars. And you register your name with the company that you buy it from, and they put it on their computer. Now, with this little spark transmitter, no matter where you are in the world, if you have a problem and you have no other means of communication, you press this little button, the spark transmitter. And the signal goes right up to a satellite and then is sent down to the to the uh, offices of the company that uh, that you bought it from. Then they contact the, uh, the the proper authorities. So you know, within a few seconds, you can get your message out, no matter where you are, whether you're in the Middle East, the Pacific, the Atlantic, if you're in the bush in, in Australia. Or, or in the uh, deserts of the Sahara. So that's probably the latest thing that I have heard of. That's called a spark transmitter. I think it's S P A R C. Uh, okay. Any any further comments? Uh, I guess none of you heard about that. The spark transmitter. Uh, that's the latest, latest and the greatest. K D two C T. What do you got to say, Rob? This is uh, Alpha Delta 2, Charlie Tango to NE2Q. Uh, yeah, again, I've only been a ham for about a year, so all this is new to me, but very interesting. Again, uh, thanks for prepping this. And I looked up uh, the Emergency Beacon Corporation. Uh, they're still in business and operating out of the Bronx, and it looks like the uh, it was founded by the same uh, gentleman that you mentioned. So. Um, it seems they're still going, and uh, again, very interesting. So, uh, once again, thanks for preparing this. Uh, NE2Q, Alpha Delta 2, Charlie Tango. Okay, Rob, very good. Yeah, well, you, you sort of got into radio communications uh, uh, in the modern technology. David, any thoughts? KD2, EVI, NE2Q. Q in a group from KD2. Yeah, well, thank you for this. It's fun and interesting topic. You enjoyed that. And with all the satellite radios, is, uh, ships are no longer required to carry a radio officer anymore. They're just uh, required to have a satellite radio on um, when operating offshore. So, it, uh, Titanic sinking gave a big boost to, uh, to radio, and uh, technology is... Uh, Sort of move, moving on from the individual operator, but uh, it's fun tonight. Thank you. 
But I was in his factory and I saw them, they were working, uh, at one point they were working 24 hours a day. Uh, they making those uh, those little uh, emergency locator transmitters. It was quite a sight to see the, uh, the rush because they had no competition at the beginning. Eventually everybody got into that, you know, Collins Radio started making them and everybody uh, was uh, making any type of uh, communications equipment for for the aircraft industry got into making those things, but he had a big head start. Uh, uh, Steve Glatz, who is a, he was a very nice fellow. Unfortunately, he passed away at a very early age. Uh, the Spark S P A R C. Search for Spark. And put the word GPS in there or emergency uh, locator. Uh, go ahead, Luigi. Uh, wait a while. Let's see. Did I hear from Mike yet? I'm getting uh, confused here. Mike, did uh, did you have any further comments? No, not at this time, Jay. Uh, I guess it's uh, it's Lou's turn, so uh, I'll turn it back over to you or uh, from N2AB. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, go ahead, Luigi. I think we'll probably shut it down unless anybody else wants to talk about this stuff. Uh, this is N2Q. Okay, KD2ITZ returning. Well, uh, we certainly have no shortage of um, uh, emergency communications equipment uh, at this time. Um, yeah, I did read a book about um, the uh, Iridium phones and uh, how that almost went out of business and that they almost um, decommissioned the satellites but they shifted their focus to uh, government contracts and to the military, and uh, they were able to keep that going. And, um, you know, it seems like every day um, you hear about new and different satellite technology that gets deployed. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, so many people go out into the backcountry and uh, have no idea that the cell phones um, aren't the best tool for the job. And so many people are lulled into a false sense of security thinking that they could um, head out into the woods and, and, and use their cell phone for emergencies. And, uh, you know, that's not the case at all. So, um, it, it's, you know, it's great that we have amateur radio, but it's also important for people to know um, what the other options are because um, uh, 4G, 5G communication is, is not really set up in the backcountry. All right, very much enjoyed this. Uh, great to hear everybody on the air. Of course, uh, tomorrow night we're going to do the roundtable at the same time. So um, hope, hopefully we'll catch you all tomorrow. NE2Q, KD2ITZ. Okay, this is NE2Q. Very good. Yes, uh, you know, different things pop into my head uh, when I was in the Coast Guard. Yes, uh, uh, in those days, uh, the ELTs transmitted on, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, I think something about 158 megahertz, no, 121.1, 121.1, and 143 megahertz. And uh, all aircraft, commercial aircraft, were required to monitor when they were in the air, those frequencies and the Coast Guard monitor them. All of that is obsolete now. Nobody uses that equipment anymore. So things constantly change. Well thank you very much for coming on here and uh, uh, it was fun to research this stuff and when you get a chance to look this stuff up and definitely look up uh, do a search for the uh, actual a uh, log of communications that were copied from Cape Race, Newfoundland Station. They've got every, all the uh, exact wording of all the uh, communications. It's very interesting. Everybody have a good night. And uh, maybe I'll get on there tomorrow night. This is NE2Q, clear. Thank you for coming on, everyone.